This is Swarfcast. I'm Noah Graff, here with my favorite co-host, Lloyd Graff. I am so honored to be with my dad, Lloyd, celebrating our 150th episode of Swarfcast. This actually is the 155th episode, but... We had some other things to take care of before then, a few really important interviews. So I waited until it was the right time to do this. It's been a long slog sometimes to get to 150 episodes. I wondered at about 130, I wondered if that was actually possible. Lately, uh, we've been a little bit slower due to various circumstances, but we keep going and I, I'm I'm just really proud. I think the show it's really become something great and it's it's improved over time. This episode is gonna be a little bit self indulgent. We're gonna think about some of our old favorite episodes, play a few clips and look back on how the show has changed, uh maybe a little bit back at what's going on nowadays versus what was going on in 2018 now let's let's just get started oh man i really thought i was getting smoother with the show and then right when i think i'm getting better i just sound like like this um so my first confession is that we have a very good editor he really makes me sound way better than i actually do Well, let me say something. Thank you. I feel prouder of the podcast than I do of my own writing. And I often tell people, listen to this podcast that Noah did. Listen to this podcast that Noah did if you really want to learn something about the business. I learn more from listening to your podcast than I do from writing my blog. Because basically, you know, I'm pulling my own bullshit out of my tuchus uh, to keep writing the blog consistently yeah. and you know i feel like sometimes i really have something to say and other times uh i don't have as much to say i think they all come out readable but i think i learn more from yours well thank you i mean part of it is that i produced it versus you so you're learning something that i produced but my goal whether it's blog writing or podcasting it 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 has to be one of a couple things it either has to teach something new to people it has to entertain them or at least it has to make them think um and reflect and that's what uh, that's what we're going for, and I, I think we generally accomplish that. Um, it's fascinating to look back over the last four years. Um, that was when our first podcast was released in uh, June of 2018. We actually recorded our first one in April, um, so it really has been four years. And today, I went back and listened to the first episode, and. It was funny because it wasn't even called Swarfcast. It was called the Today's Machining World podcast. And then we struggled with it, whether we wanted to push that brand of Today's Machining World. And there was something about it, you know, at least you had machining in it. People might know what the heck it is versus Swarfcast, which is like Swarf blog, our blog. And people in the industry know what Swarf is. Some of them. Some of them. But... It was a difficult decision a bit um, because you wonder if people are just going to, you know, if they're looking around iTunes for a podcast, if they're going to see Swarfcast, um, you know, it's in the machining like category, but it's sort of an insider word. That- yeah. I sometimes wonder if it it's too cute for its own good um, and we lose more people than we gain by using uh, Swarf in the title of yours and mine. I don't think it's cute. I don't know. The people that know what Swarf is 
tend to think it's a great name. Except today, unless you're from England, not that many people even know what Swarf is. It's clever. Clever isn't always great. Well, I, maybe that's just something to reflect on uh, after this. It does say today's machining world in the little thumbnail for the podcast. Mm -hmm. But it's hard. Once you have this many episodes, you feel like, well, people are going to look for you in this way. It's good to critique yourself, though. And we constantly do that in the business, in the machine tool business. And we have to critique uh, ourselves in the uh, creative business, too. True. Let's think of a few episodes uh, that really stuck out for me. And if you have any others that come to mind, you can chime in. You know, it's interesting to think about how some episodes really excite you and I, Lloyd, and maybe less so others. Maybe we've said this a bunch of times already, or maybe this is, you know, not that original. Then other people hear that episode and they go, oh my God, like that was my favorite thing that totally spoke to me. Yeah, because um, you're bringing in a different audience and bringing in a younger audience very often. And uh, very often they have not thought about some of the issues that you're talking about, they haven't uh, heard of various people who you are interviewing, and uh, therefore you're bringing something new and challenging to them uh, that they're looking for. That and it, it just we go through the same, uh, some of the same things over and over again skills shortage, this process, and that. And I go, man, I've heard that so many times, but. Not everybody here has listened to uh, 154 of them. You know, what, what seems like like a rerun for me is not the same for everybody. Also, when we first started and we were trying to find people to interview, we were thinking, all right, we should interview people that have products. Um, people, you know, that's like the holy grail of a lot of machining companies. And, and people do like those episodes, but I was suggesting various clients, as I remember, uh, clients of Graf Pinkert. And as I remember, Dad, you were saying, well, you know, there's just a job shop. What is that? Are people that going to be that interested in what they're doing? And it turned out that often people, what people really want is to hear the stories of others that are doing the same thing as them because there's so many different ways they you could go about it. You know, one thing I really liked uh, was um, this episode 63 and 64. It was, it was an interview with David Wynn. It was called Running a Machining Company Like a Tech Company. We're a crazy bunch. I mean, you know, if you think about today in a manufacturing environment and, and you tell your employees, here's keys, here's the code to the building, here's the work that needs to be done, you get it done. I don't care when you're here. I don't care what hours you sh show up. I don't care if you show up at all. As long as this work gets out the door and we hit the numbers, we're good to go. Wow. And if you tell a group of people that, and then you, you can, I mean, most people look at me like I'm a space alien when I talk about that. And, and I'll, I'll admit that, you know, it's kind of funny. You give people that much freedom and they still generally show up like you normally would expect. So that's why you're saying you, you run it like a tech company. Yeah, that's exactly why, because we look at things differently. This is a guy who runs one of the oldest types of screw machines you can get out there, Brown and Sharps, which for most people, they would, they don't even know what one is, let alone, you know, what it can do. But these, these machines that you could buy for $1,500 at an auction, this guy's making a ton of money with them. And the ironic thing is, is he's running his shop like he likes to say, like a tech company, like a very modern way of doing it. Not um, he's not paying the people to just come and punch the clock on the hour. He's giving them flexible hours. He's giving them the ability to get their work done and then they can leave. He doesn't always have to be there. He's not micromanaging. It's so interesting how 
we've interviewed people that have been super successful doing in any number of different ways. So we talk to him and then we'll talk to somebody that has 300 employees and it's a lot more of the old school standard way that people have been doing it for, you know, the last 50 years. And then we'll talk to people that have a Swiss shop or just a regular, you know, using say mills and it'll be one person or one person and an assistant and they'll have a whole business just doing that. And I mean, to me, it seems crazy. Uh, absolutely no redundancy whatsoever, but there are people, um, like the guy we just interviewed in the last podcast, uh, he just went all by himself for the last 15 years and was able to retire. His name is Tyler Jarrah's and he was able to retire when he was 40. Just did it all by himself. I, I mean, it seems kind of nuts to me, but at the same time, you save a lot of other issues by doing it all yourself. What I find fascinating is that we are now seeing more entrepreneurs, more single people going into business than I've seen probably in the history of Grant Pinkert. Uh, and this is really ultra fascinating to me. It means that uh, there are ambitious people out there who have developed skills one way or another over the last few years. There is demand for product that they see. They see an opportunity to get business immediately. Very often they have a partner or a spouse who backs them up with income. Mm -hmm. Um, they usually start in a barn <laughs> or uh, in a, a, uh, a garage or a very small rented property nearby, and they take a shot, and uh, they get a mortgage on their home. They use their savings. They find somebody to lend them some money, and... They go into business, and some of them make it, and some of them don't, and some of them... And you think uh, this is because, one of the things is because of technology, because you can do lights out with CNC Swiss. Yes. Easier to network. Yes, but uh, I think there's a, a confluence of factors. Uh, you have those technical factors, you have... Uh, the demand factor that people see out there. You have uh, lack of uh, ability for older companies to attract people. Mm -hmm. You have uh, ambitious people who feel thwarted uh, in uh, the job world. All of this comes together and you find youngish entrepreneur starting up in the machine precision machining business it's a beautiful phenomenon for me to see yeah yeah well, one of the issue, one of the episodes that people really liked was one uh it was a, a customer of graph pinkert his name is dulio arayano and yeah he was a an immigrant from mexico and he started a business i don't know what was it five six years ago i think worked for tornos and then eventually, uh, through contacts working for Tornos, was able to start out on his own. And that actually reminds me of another episode that I really liked. Um, we did a whole season, actually, about how people find work, how businesses acquire new customers. And that was very interesting, just the diverse ways, the old school way with the manufacturer's rep versus word of mouth. Um, which I suppose is also, that's about as old school as you get. <laughs> and you see that in, in a number of different people I, I've talked to over, over time. This one person, this was somebody we've interviewed twice, actually. His name is Jay Souter, his company, Souter Machine. He's a Mennonite, and he specializes in making parts for Amish. He makes parts for the hubs that go on the wheels for Amish wagons. So that's where some of our customers came from, is from within the Mennonite or Amish community. 
That is very interesting. One of the things that we do is uh, we designed a hydraulic brake system for the Amish and they're not carriages. They already had brakes on their carriages, but they, they were importing them from China. They were cast iron rear cylinders and we developed a aluminum wheel cylinder that is hard coat anodized. It has a rock weld like 55 or 60. It's, it's and it's very water resistant, works very well. Um, we also have a master cylinder that we developed and those really went well. We started in 2012, we started making those. And since then, uh, we have 140,000 wheel cylinders out. Wow. And actually our horizontal mill is sitting out there carving away at another order of 3,500. Being a Mennonite, he has a certain connection with the Amish because, you know, he's Mennonite aren't Amish, but they're sort of, I don't know, how would you say it? They're like the cousins of Amish in a way. Slightly less strict, but they share con various contacts and various comfort with each other. And, and this guy, he said he does have a one page website. Um, and he said he's never actually gotten any actual uh, clients from it, um, but he hasn't needed it. He has more work than, than he can get. Um, he, he doesn't just make stuff for the Amish. I think he makes stuff for Parker and a lot of different clients. And that just brings me to the fact that it's one of the most fun parts of the podcast is just meeting such a diverse group of people, getting to know them, you know, and, and then we'll, we'll deviate. We'll deviate to, uh, well, one of my favorites was the Negotiation Podcast. We interviewed um, Chris Voss and Brandon Voss, who wrote a pretty famous book on negotiation called Never Split the Difference. And just some of the stuff they said just blew me away. Brandon and I hate not making deals. And we think it's really stupid for us to have driven a deal from the table by taking an extreme position when we should have made the deal, we should have explored it. We should have found out what the other side could have thrown on the table. Right. So if you let them start, at least you're going to start something rather than just scare them away. It's information. Their first price is information. How do you know that they're not going to start out with a price that was better than what you would have asked for in the first place? I don't care what percentage of time that is. I'm not willing to give those dollars up as a starting point. You may come up with a number that, that was higher than what I wanted or better for me than what I wanted. I want to make that happen because then it's an opportunity. It was your idea. You're more likely to stick to that if I can get you to, to fight for that price. So then you're much more invested. You're going you're gonna to execute. So we don't believe in, in higher anchoring. Now, there are other things that we do, but uh, you know, throwing out an extreme position to start with is, is not something we believe in. I'm gonna throw out one more idea to put some context on this, and then I'm gonna ask Brian to jump in. And this, this is why the bargaining skills from kidnapping negotiation directly applicable to the business world. So I'm working at kidnapping someplace anywhere in the world. And again, our skills have been test driven everywhere. So it doesn't matter whether I'm in Bogota or Baghdad or Beirut. So the, the commanders I'm working for say, when is this gonna be over? And I'll say, when the bad guys feel like they've gotten the best deal they can. Mm -hmm. Not when they got the best deal they could, when they felt like it. Yes. We're talking about kidnappers' feelings. As soon as they feel it was a good deal. That's exactly what you described. You get somebody looking to buy from you, they got to feel like they got a good deal. They got to feel like they worked for it. They got to feel like they fought for Otherwise, it. Otherwise, they'll be unhappy. Exactly. And um, the interview you did with the fellow who wrote the book on serendipity was one of your best, I thought. Thank you. Thank you. That was one of my favorites as well. Uh, so if anybody's looking for some of these interviews, you want to go find them. This, the serendipity one is episode 123 with Christian Bush. We're not pitching people. We're not saying... I open a corner store and I want you to invest into this, or I open a corner store and I want a new supplier. We're just saying, let's put a couple of hooks out there that allow us to then have more of this happen. And so to give an example, a wonderful friend of mine, Ollie Barrett in London, he's this, this fantastic entrepreneur. If you would ask him the, what do you do question, right? Which we get asked all the time. He would say something like, well, I'm a technology entrepreneur. 
recently started reading into the philosophy of science, but what I'm really excited about is playing the piano. And so what he's doing here is he's casting three hooks where you could be like, oh my God, such a coincidence. I recently started hosting Piano Martinez. You should, should stop by. Oh my God, such a coincidence. My sister is teaching the philosophy of science in this in this high school. You should give a guest lecture. Whatever it is, like for every interest we have, we can use every interaction to see that in a very non kind of, um, you know, like non-obvious way, but in a way that allows others to say, oh, that is interesting. And, and, and that's really something which, which I find fascinating because that's really to your point. We're not forcing it. We're not pushing it on someone and say, you have to take this pitch and run with it. But we're just saying, you know what, maybe we can make the conversation with the uncle whom we really didn't want to call a bit more interesting by just bringing in a couple of these things and just see what flies. And to your point earlier, right, that is at the core of good business. Like a good salesperson will consistently bring in other hooks, right? They will say, oh, you're interested in this item. This is so interesting because this person who bought this last time, it was so interesting. They they, they did this with this and they did this and then the customer might be, oh my God, interesting. I didn't even know I can use it this way. You know, the point here is that good salespeople in a way build that into every conversation. But I think by building a muscle for this, we do that then more consciously as well and then becomes part of, of who we are. Would you say that that kind of spoke to you as a machine tool dealer? Oh, for sure. Uh, but really how you run your life and uh, whether you are uh, looking to take advantage of opportunities or just uh, are very passive about uh, looking at uh, the, the path that your life takes and what is presented to you if you have the willingness to look at it yeah. from with a little distance. And, you have to and, keep then, your, and keep your eyes open, connect the dots. Right. It's something that I've uh, believed in for a long, long time, but he explains it in a beautiful way with great clarity and enthusiasm. And uh, uh, he gives certain certain tricks to how you do it. So, for instance, this is what he calls um, a serendipity bomb. You come up with, say, six people who out there you you're trying to do a certain thing and you think okay these six people might be able to help me in this quest that i'm trying to accomplish and you know may, they may seem like long shots but if you contact six people there's an okay chance that maybe one of them is going to get back to you and make a huge difference um he also talks about something called serendipity hooks which is where you you introduce yourself to a person and when they ask you what you do, instead of saying, hey, my name is Noah, I'm a machinery dealer. You say, hey, I'm Noah, I'm a machinery dealer, but I also have a podcast and I go salsa dancing when I have a chance. After you say that, you have planted several different seeds in their minds. Maybe they look at you when you say machinery dealer and they go, huh? Like, because a lot of people don't really know what a machine tool is. But then they hear podcasts and they go, oh, well, what's this podcast about? And then you can start a conversation and all of a sudden you may have this connection and it could be something that, you know, changes your life for all you know. No d question. And, uh, uh, I, I was thinking about it today on Mother's Day, and I was thinking about uh, how in the world did I meet uh, my wife, Risa, you know, and uh, when I had basically gone to play ping pong, ping pong that night, you know. And, you had your eyes open. But I did have my eyes open looking uh, for another opportunity. And what was it about me uh, and her uh, that connected. I mean, we were seven years apart in age, and uh, I had had a, a lot of different experiences from her, uh, but there was some connection that uh, we were able to develop quite rapidly. You know, that makes me think of back to when this show started 2018 that was when i got married so that just goes to show 
I, number one, I can't believe I've been married four years. Can you believe that? That seems like a long time. It's gone by fast. Well, uh, I remember the first real conversation that I had with Stephanie. You had invited her to our timeshare in San Diego. You hadn't talked to her before? Oh, I had talked to her, but, uh, you know, the the kinds of basic questions, uh, get-to-know-you questions that uh, um, really don't uh, uncover any depth about a person. Oh, okay. So this is when she was on vacation with us. Yeah. I asked her to take a walk with me. And, well, as I recall, I said, would anybody like to take a walk with me? And she volunteered, which I thought was gutsy of her. And so we took a walk around the uh, condominium area. And I decided to ask her questions that actually were substantive questions that I wanted to know. I wanted to know her answers and I wanted to know how she would answer uh, because it was clear to me that this was a relationship that uh, was moving quickly between you and her. I remember almost right out of the gate, I said, look, you're a very attractive uh, woman. Uh, you lived in New York. Why aren't you married? <laughs> and she answered the question in a very straightforward way. And she didn't look at me like I was some kind of uh, an ogre. She said, I simply did not find anybody when I was in New York who really connected with me as a person. They looked at me and they wanted to know what I did and they wanted action and they didn't really care about who I was as, as an individual. And, and then after I moved to Chicago, I met Noah, and Noah was different than anybody else I had ever met. Oh, that's true. And he was interested in me as a person. He wasn't interested in me as a thing. We immediately connected on an honest level. You and her or her and me? No, her and I. <laughs> Um, and almost within 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I understood the connection between the two of you, and I expected that you would ultimately get married. Hmm. Is, is there anybody off the top of your head uh, who you would like to see us interview? I'd like to see you interview um, a clergyman a clergy person. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see you interview a psychologist. We already did that. Interviewed a couple of them, including your son. Basically, you want me to interview every person in our immediate family? <laughs> You've never done an interview with Risa? Risa, my mom, she is a um, educational therapist, specializes in working with people with learning disabilities. And that does seem like something that could be important to a lot of listeners of the show. So that's coming, I think. One week where I can't figure out anybody else to interview. <laughs> she'll be... <laughs> Somehow, I'd like to see you interview somebody on the spectrum and see if Maybe you I could... Maybe I have already. Yeah, see if you could get them to talk about their struggles. Interesting. Somebody on the spectrum that's involved in our industry. You know, one thing I'd love is if we could get some more audience participation in the show. I would love it if people would, you know, write in some questions or write in questions for the for us with the blog or write in questions for the podcast. Maybe I need to work harder at polling people and getting them to participate that would be something exciting to have people write in or call in and create some more interactivity yeah we haven't reached that threshold yet which is sad but we keep trying yeah 
I really look forward to doing a lot more podcasts. Just became a father a month ago, so slowed down a little bit. I'm 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 doing every other. Hopefully that will, you know, it can still sustain itself with that. But uh, I don't plan on going anywhere for the foreseeable future. It, it, it does take a lot of time, but it's, you know, it's something I really, really like doing. And it, I think it enriches my life somewhat. I think I would feel empty if I didn't have something like this, some kind of outlet. I'm just grateful for all the people that, that care. I have to say again that I'm amazed at what you've made out of this podcast and how you continue to um, widen the audience. And uh, it should be wider by now. It should be more people. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I think it's wider than you think, and I think uh, it's it's only going to grow and. Uh, I say, and I tell you this frequently, I continue to learn from you and I feel like uh, I'm being coached by you. Uh, so, um, Likewise. Uh, the thing maybe that I'm proudest about uh, is how you've grown and how you've uh, grabbed on to this opportunity uh, with the podcasts. Thank you. Well, uh, it's always fun when I get to do it with you. I know it's, I can't expect to do it with you every single time, um, but it's extra fun when we get to do it together. So thanks thank now. You. Thank you. All right. I guess that's it. Mm -hmm.